What kind of venue is it going to be in? Like this is a room that seats 150, but over at Bass Hall that seats nearly 3,000. And in here it would only be playing over a small ensemble or playing solo. And Bass Hall, the Boston Symphony performed there as they did for about 25 years. It had to be heard over an orchestra. And so you pick uh, the piano has the voice that's appropriate for the venue and the use it's going to be put to. But then also there's some pianos that just are more beautiful than others. We had a, a candidate for the piano faculty here this morning playing in our other hall, and there are two, two American Steinways in there. One's about 20 years old, and one's about eight or nine. And he was trying to pick them, and one of them is warm and dark and beautiful. And I said, this is more, you know, solo piano. The other one is really bright and clear and powerful, projects. And that's the one that we want to use with the uh, big ensembles. And so, that, uh, part of that would be then whether it's appropriate for the repertory and the venue and so forth. But some pianos are just, they're just some that are more beautiful than others. One of the most important characteristics really for the beauty of sound is the sustain, or what we call the decay. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like a violin where you can just keep the tone going continuously or with circular breathing with a wind instrument. But the sound dies away almost immediately. And so it's an illusion that the sound that it sings and the sound sustains, which is somewhat supported by the pedal and the skills of the pianist. But also there is a, a matter of how quickly the sound decays. Uh, I was doing a selection once and we looked at a piano and played, this, this is a room, it's so with uh, five uh, badges. This room had about 10 concert grams in a row. Uh, some of them were very rough, they were brand new. But we were comparing some notes. On one piano, this note just went and died away. It didn't have this lingering kind of quality. That's definitely one uh, one characteristic that we look for is a bloom to the sound or singing quality, especially in the soprano. Also, balance. Like it's nice to have a really good, rich bass, but if it, does, if it overpowers the soprano and the pianist is constantly having to work to try to keep things in balance, are these features that you can adjust? Yes, there is some adjustment, a lot. It's called voicing. And there are three, three primary things that we technicians do to a piano, three major areas of service. 
One is tuning, which is really just adjusting the tension on the strings. I mean, we don't do it arbitrarily. You're listening to the and so forth. But that's, that has to do with intonation, cycles per second, tension on the strings. The other is mechanical, which will be more apparent when I pull the action out. But the, um, that's, that's adjusting the action of the keyboard to work properly. It's a very complex mechanism. And then the third is voicing which is primarily but not exclusively working with the hammer felt. And the voicer has a lot of, of power and latitude over the instrument. Also the choice of the parts that go in the hammers that are used in the action. I can take that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is what we call the action. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> oh wow. wow! And so these are the felt mallets, the hammers that hit the strings. And uh, you can choose, there are lots of different sources for these. These did not come from the Steinway factory, these came from um, uh, Germany, a major uh, supplier in Germany. And uh, the Steinway hammers tend to be softer, mellower, traditionally. And these tend to be much more compact and dense for a really bright, clear sound. Mm -hmm. But you have some options there. And then we work with the felt with shaping and needles and so forth to get just the sound that we want and to make it perfectly even from note to note. But it's perfectly even at all dynamics. So it might be perfectly even when you're playing really loud, but if you're playing uh, very, very softly, it may be very uneven. So you have to work with all the various dynamic levels mm. to make sure it's very even from note to note, balanced in the registers, and that um, the sound what did you call this piece? The action? The action. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's the when you do when you talked about having needles with felt, you mean like felting? No, I'm actually you? sticking needles in the felt. Yeah, that's what I meant. You're looking for uh, uh, hard spots. <gasps> I, I was at a pool table. I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> a little low class analogy there. <laughs> but sometimes you're also trying to harden the felt. But we use chemical hardeners sometimes to harden the felt. It's too dull. Chemical? Does this be? You do this regularly, or you do it once and it's done for life? It's a constant tweak. You On know? those felts? Yes. I was thinking about it today when I was talking to this guest pianist that we were talking about voicing. The, you know, uh, I've read interviews with famous pianists, and they talked about there was a certain Beethoven sonatas that they said, you know, it was a lifetime of work, and I still don't feel like I, there's no such thing as per perfection. Mm -hmm. You know, you just keep finding more, especially the work that has a lot of depth. And, um, no, like, 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 we with your and so you, uh, you, you know, you can spend a lifetime, so I can't say, uh, working with a certain piece of music and still never feel that you've explored all of the possibilities. And the same thing with voicing, you know, it's, it changes with the weather and humidity. Oh, yeah. So, so, yeah. so do you have to be a pianist to appreciate all of that stuff, or can you just tell like, if somebody else plays, I need to fix this? I need to fix this. Yes, well, I would be really out of luck if I had to be an advanced pianist. <laughs> <laughs> I was a music major for one year in college, and I ran up against a serious obstacle, which was lack of talent. <laughs> 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 so, so, you have to replace the, these things. Well, with the hammers, it depends on how often it's used, how much it's used, and how it's used. Uh, there's some pianists that have been around for 50 years and haven't really had anywhere because of their grandmother's power and she only played Come to Jesus in whole notes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in our practice rooms, you know, where they're being played on all day long, it's sort of like a chopping block. Uh, oh, sure. uh, so all pianos have this, this little action. Uh, but it's smaller and it's smaller grounds. The larger the ground, the better the, the leverage of uh, the keys. It should be a two to one okay. ratio. And oh, so yeah. there's compromises in small grands and small uprights. And okay. uh, the bigger the piano, the, the more efficient oh, the action works. Yeah, now, please don't forget me for asking this question. But like on the pianos we have upstairs, these are obviously, well, they're electronic, right? They're digital pianos. Yeah. Yeah. Digital pianos. Mm -hmm. So those have no action, right? Or I don't know. I don't, I, you know, some digital pianos do have some semblance of this. I don't know specifically what's inside of these ones. But okay. nothing this complex. Yes, yeah, some do. I think Yamaha makes some pianos uh, that are the uh, tone generation is all electronic. It doesn't really have strings, mm. but the, it has a real action, and it feels more like a real piano. But it, would, but it wouldn't have the depth and the variation of voices and yeah. none of that. Mm. Sort of 
Well, the, it, it's, uh, there's no variation. It's, it, it's programmed, you know. It's, but I would say one thing, I was advising a friend recently who's, try, who's uh, impecunious and trying to find, afford a decent piano for a child to start lessons. And I said, you know, rather than get a cheap old upright, especially a spin it, I'd consider getting a digital piano. Huh. Because there's so many tonal and mechanical compromises and very small uprights and little tiny baby grands yeah. that you're probably better off with a digital piano. But there comes a point, especially in a child's musical development, where they'd be better off with a real acoustic piano because of the total possibilities are greater. Can, can you show how those pedals, or what the pedals do, and you show them the action how that happens? It's hard to do it with the action out. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, Tell us about it. Well, the, the pedal on the right, far right, that's different on uh, upright pianos and even some grands. But most most uh, fine grands, this is the way they're free. Pedal. There's actually a, 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 a an Italian piano that's made in Milano called Fazioli, which costs a fortune. They're very beautiful, but their ten foot piano has four pedals. But most most pianos, and a lot of the 19th century pianos only had two pedals. But um, in fact, a lot of the repertory, uh, even Debussy apparently had a, 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 a six-foot backslide with only two pedals. But most modern grand pianos have three pedals. The right pedal is called the damper pedal. And what that does is raise all of these uh, dampers. There are these dampers here. Yeah. And the dampers have a little bit of felt on the other side, and that felt uh, is what dampens the sound. So when you play, oh, right. play a note, the damper is raised with the key. Oops. Yep. When you play a note, the damper is raised with the key, and then when you release, uh, the damper falls back and the felt stops. Ah, yeah. But with the right pedal, you raise all the dampers at once, and so you can get a wash of sound. And uh, it helps you to create legato. Although I was just listening to this master class by our piano candidate, and he was uh, encouraging students to do a lot of practice without pedal so that they learn how to do legato with their fingers instead of just using the pedal mm -hmm. uh, for uh, inflection purposes. So that's the right pedal is the most frequently used. Some people call it the loud pedal. It does make things sort of loud, but it's really more for um, changing color and connecting uh, and for supporting legato playing. The middle pedal is more complex. If I get this action in just right, because it won't work without it. But the middle pedal allows you, no, too far in. Nope, too far out. <laughs> so the middle pedal is called the sostenuto. Steinway was the first one to patent it. And then you can play normally and pedal uh, normally around the notes that you're sustaining individually, mm. and, or even clusters of notes. And so that's very useful, and it's used a lot in uh, modern, a lot of contemporary compositions uh, with extended techniques and so forth. Basically, it allows you to do, sustain just a few notes, the notes that you have depressed. It's not something that the average pianist would use very much. In fact, I've met piano teachers who didn't really know how it worked, but not here. <laughs> and then the uh, third pedal, the left pedal, is what we call the soft pedal, which um, sometimes are the shift pedal, or the unicorda, which means single string. But basically what that pedal does is shift the whole action to the right a bit on a grand. It doesn't do that on an upright. And uh, what it does is shift the hammer so that instead of hitting three strings throughout most of the scale, it's hitting only two. And instead of hitting on the grooved port, the strings make uh, compacted grooves in the hammers. And so you have these really bright, hard uh, sections of felt where the groove is, and then you have these softer mounds of felt uh, uh, between the grooves. And so you shift so that you're on the softer felt, and it gives you not only a softer sound, but it's also a tonal shift. So pianists, some, I've heard some piano teachers say pianists really need to learn how to play soft with their fingers and use the, the shift pedal, the left pedal, for uh, color uh, changes. It gives a uh, kind of, um, how would you, what is a, I'm struggling for a word. A word. I'm thinking of dead It's like you know. or something. It's like a, yeah, the type of sound is more, uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain with words, more intimate, but you're looking for a, 
a sound that it is it's, it's yeah it's a different color it's not it's not as clear and not as, it's more What's yeah that? muffled isn't a very good not word that's, that's not muffled yeah. that's not a good as, it's not as bright it's not as bright, yeah, it's a color change, and, and it almost has this airy quality to it, mm -hmm. I'd say. It's kind of like it exists in another hemisphere. Fuzzy, a little fuzzy. Yeah, fuzzy, fuzzy yeah. Yeah. ethereal, maybe. Yeah. 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 How have you guys evolved? Is there some technological breakthrough or evolution that tells you what the next steps likely to be? Oh, oh, uh, we quit making steps in piano uh, uh, technology back around 1870 when this piano was perfected. This, this is 1870 technology that really hasn't changed much. I mean, they stopped using varnish and started using lacquer in the 20s when they were trying to speed. Uh, varnish took forever to dry, and it wouldn't dry well when it was humid. And so lacquer was a great improvement. Now they use polyester, which is what that German style we have, that shiny, bright, like you see on the Japanese and other Asian pianos. Is this a climate control environment then? Is it? Did you say it? We do. We're very fortunate in this building, uh, this building in general, uh, has climate control. It's not absolute because there's too many external doors mm -hmm. and it's too big, mm -hmm. but in Bates, which has its own climate control system across the way, the big recital hall with the organ, we have very, very good climate control in there. The pianos are just rock solid, hardly ever go out of tune. Mm -hmm. so. What size it feels? <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. Three streets, it, uh, it increases the volume. That, now, that, uh, the piano was at the forefront of technology and innovation in the 19th century. And they did, uh, early on pianos had three strings. We have a forte piano, so-called, which is a historical piano of only five octaves. That was the kind of piano that Mozart had when he was uh, in his last days. It's mm -hmm. a copy of his Walter. And it has two strings all the way up to this note. It starts here. It has two strings, and then from here on up to here, which is the last note, it has three strings. So they found by triple stringing they could increase the, the volume of the sound, but it only increases it by about 17%. It's not like if you go from one string to two strings, you double the sound, mm -hmm. but it does significantly increase the sound. But the 19th century, in the 19th century, the piano manufacturers were like, they were the uh, Fords and the Edisons and the uh, um, um, Steve Jobs and people like that of their day. They were the big innovators. And when you went to these big international trade shows, like the Great Paris Exhibition and London Exhibition and so forth, piano manufacturers were uh, sort of, they stole the, the center stage with their innovations. And Steinway was right at the lead. In fact, right after the Civil War, they won a big, uh, a big uh, international, they won a prize at a big international uh, show in Paris, which sort of established them as tops of the trade uh, and someone to emulate. First, it's the way the bass strings cross over the treble strings down there, called cross stringing. It allows you to have a longer string in a case of a given size than if it was the bass strings were straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, this gets into a little bit into uh, physics of sound. But this is the top note on the piano, and the speaking portion of the string for the top note is two inches long. And in theory, if the strings were all the same thickness, then this would be four inches. This is an octave down. This would be 8, 16, and so forth. I'll run out of mm -hmm. that. But what you want up with is a 20 foot long piano. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to get the strings to fit within a case of a given size, they get progressively thicker as you go down. And then, when you get to the really low notes, of wet wrapped in copper. <coughs> and so, uh, you can only do so much of adding mass to the strings without deadening the sound. And that's one of those shortcomings of baby grands and small upright spinets and so forth, is that the bass strings get, uh, are much thicker than they would be on here, and so they're kind of dull. As one of my colleagues said, it can sound like somebody beating on the lid of a garbage can. <laughs> so uh, that was that cross stringing, that's called, that was an innovation. And also another innovation was the Bessemer process in the 19th century, which allowed the annealing of, of steel. Because in the prior to that, steel was uh, producing steel was a very uh, time-consuming process, burning coke and coal and so forth, and it was focused mostly on sp springs for watches and clocks and carriage springs, and pianos tended to have soft strings, and so you couldn't brass and soft iron, and you couldn't put a lot of tension on them because they would break, and so you didn't have a lot of power, and you and the pitch was lower. 
But around the time when Liszt was having uh, his early rock star career, which ended when he was 35, everybody thinks of Liszt, I think of this rock star who was having affairs with all the titled ladies of Europe. Well, that was in his younger days. He lived to be in his 70s, and he, he changed considerably. But at any rate, during that point, the piano was evolving a lot. And uh, they were beginning to add more notes to the compass, and they were beginning to add more strings per note and they were adding more tension and raising pitch because pianos really hadn't been, you know, public concerts were not commonplace in the early 19th century when Liszt was having his early career. The, that was, they were reserved for the aristocracy and also uh, ecclesiastical courts and, and aristocratic courts had concerts. Mozart was sort of an innovator in his later days because he had public concerts and sold subscriptions Magic Flute was written for his last opera, his opera was written for uh, public concerts, but they weren't that common. Liszt was the one who really uh, established, well, Paganini established the solo recital with the fiddle, and Liszt sort of emulated him with this rock star image and playing with his profile to the audience. But then they began having bigger orchestras, pitch started rising, the center to pitch, it's now about A440, which is 440 cycles a second. But in box time, it was uh, a half step lower, approximately. There was no standardization, but approximately. So uh, the pianos needed to have more reinforcing. So you began to see more of this cast iron. Originally, there were just bars and plates. And it was um, an American innovator who made the first cast iron frame. And uh, uh, who was it? Was it Steinway? Who made the, the first one piece cast iron frame for what we call a flugel brand, this kind of brand. But that enabled them to have increased string tension even more, mm -hmm. and that increased the power and projection of the instruments. This is called a flugelgram because that means it's German word for wing, and it means it's wing-shaped. Uh, earlier grams were bought, they were, they were rectangular. Mm -hmm. We call them square grams. You've maybe been in an old home, antebellum home or something, where this very ornate, mm -hmm. uh, looks like a coffin on fancy uh -huh. legs. Yeah. You know. They were very inefficient instruments. They were, um, the tone was very weak and small, and the actions were not very good. But uh, they persisted in America, not so much in Europe, until the late 19th century. They were very popular for Victorian homes. But the flugelgrand is, uh, was more popular in Europe than now. That's the if, if you, huge, could you yeah. mention something about the, the soundboard and, and whatever, how that is, fits in with the with the breast of the piano. This, this, this is the soundboard under here, under the strings. It's a panel of spruce. It's about an eighth of an inch thick. And uh, it's like the top panel on a violin or guitar. And it's a very resonant sort of wood, soft and light, but strong. And the soundboard is basically just glued up around the rim. It sits on a ledge around the rim, right under uh, where the uh, perimeter screws are, cast iron frame. Mm -hmm. But it's free in the middle. And it has this long bridge attached to it. And then the strings pass over the bridge and they exert downward pressure. It's called downbearing. And it's careful, that's very careful. The man in the factory who does that's called the bellyman. And it's very precise how he has to set that downward pressure. It can't be too much, not much more than 16 thousandths of an inch. So <laughs> if it's too much, it, it uh, suppresses the sound of the soundboard. But if it doesn't have enough downbearing, then the sound becomes weak and dead. And that's what happens with pianos as they get older, because the soundboard is like an upside-down saucer, and then it has all this tension of the strings, which is about equal to my standing, standing on the soundboard, that can cumulative downward weight of the pressure of the strings. And so over time, structurally, the soundboards will collapse and become sometimes wavy, or just lose their crown, what we call the crowning, and then the downbearing declines, maybe for, in spots, um, and sometimes throughout, and then the piano begins to die totally. Oh, right. You funny. can help sometimes. I mean, the average person wouldn't listen to it and say it's dead, but a professional mm -hmm. would. So if you went underneath, would you see the soundboard? Yes, you can see the soundboard, and you can see these ribs, these strips of wood that support it underneath, too. Uh, on this piano, they're probably uh, uh, sugar pine ribs, but most pianos, most manufacturers, including the Humber factory, Starway factory, uses spruce for the ribs. And the ribs help support the soundboard structurally. And they also carry the sound across the grain. 
because the sound wants to travel this way with the grain of the board goes this, the grain of the board goes this way. So the sound wants to go that way. The ribs go this way to carry the sound across the board that way as well. And the thickness of the board, uh, the ribs, and how they're feathered, and uh, how close together they're spaced, and all of that is very. It's a matter of debate and speculation, and rebuilders sometimes think they can improve and make changes in that. So. Any other questions? One other question. Could you tell us now uh, what it would cost to purchase one of these at the Steinway factory? I believe a New American Steinway concert brand in Satin and Ebony, like, well, they don't, they don't make them in Satin Ebony, lacquer, they're yeah. in polyester. Yeah. Uh, about 165000 okay. okay. And what about the uh, new Fazioli then? Where's that? Do you I have know? no idea. No I'm idea. sure it's well over two. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And Bosendorfer as well? Two million. Two hundred thousand. I priced a Hamburg Steinway two years ago. Yeah, it was like that. And it was 219000 Two hundred nineteen. Okay. But that varies with the exchange rate. And also New York, the, there's always been a rivalry between the New York and Hamburg factories. And so New York doesn't discount even offer artist discount or institutional discounts on the Hamburg. So you have to pay full pop and you have to buy it through New York. You can't go directly to Europe and buy it. Mm -hmm. you, you were saying a, a seasoned piano and that the new ones are not seasoned or something? Is that what you said? Are they, um, so this one's been played a lot and yeah. so, and you said it's one of the best at UT. Does that mean it's more valuable? Because it's older and it's... Yeah, to, to, a, you know, to a professional. It's like a Strad, you know. Someone who is just a putzer comes along and plays a Strad, and to them it may be an ordinary. There's a famous story, you know, Joshua Bell, the famous violinist. Mm -hmm. He has a violinist called the Huberman Strad. The story about that is there was a, a, a concert violinist from Europe named Huberman who was playing in Carnegie Hall in the 1920s. And I think he had two instruments with him, and he left one in his dressing room, and when he came back, it was gone. And uh, it never turned up in his lifetime. Many years later, this very, very hack musician who had uh, played in restaurants and clubs and for bar mitzvahs and things like that is on his deathbed, and he confesses to his wife that the fiddle he's been playing all these years, which he painted black, was the Huberman <laughs> Strad. <laughs> And uh, so it came back into circulation, and that's that's uh, Joshua Bell's uh, uh, strat. But as a uh, as they say, you know, uh, when a saint meets, uh, I mean, when a, a thief meets a saint, all he notices is his purse. Yeah. So uh, a person who's not a professional may not appreciate the differences, but for us, we do. But about the seasoning and aging, pianos are like uh, wines and certain cheeses. You know, certain wines and cheeses. They, they're, they're not at their best when they're new. The woods are seasoned a lot. They use kiln drying and so forth in the factory to speed it up, but they really have to get played in, and we have to do our stuff with the felts and over a period of time and change daily. And it sometimes, and the strings also are still very elastic when they're new, and when they're elastic like that, they don't have uh, their full brilliance and power. And so it takes, and they also don't want to stay in tune. So it takes uh, sometimes three, four, five years before a piano really begins to reach its peak with a lot of help from pianists playing it in and for people and giving feedback to people like me, uh, tweaking it a lot. So they're they're not at their best when they're brand new. But again, this is something that a player of high caliber would notice, but not necessarily something that's that the average piano buyer would Is there a guild of artists, master artists like you that take care of pianos for major institutions? So it, we do call ourselves a guild. It's kind of an old-fashioned term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's called the Piano Technicians Guild. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of levels of membership. You guys get together and drink heavily and... <laughs> <laughs> no, we, no, no. <laughs> we, we mostly like psychedelics. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs>